10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, this meeting. Welcome, everyone, to the uh, Planning and Housing Committee meeting. Um, First of all, just uh, like to acknowledge that Ottawa is located on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation, whose culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. Il est important de souligner que la ville d'Ottawa se trouve sur un territoire non cédé de la nation algonquine Anishinaabe, dont la culture et la présence sont enrichies et continuent d'enrichir ces terres. I'll ask the clerk for a roll call, please. Councillor Brockington. Here. Councillor Curry. Here. Councillor Dudas. Here. Councillor Johnson. Here. Councillor Cavanaugh. Here. Councillor Kelly. Present. Councillor Kitts. Here. Councillor Lowe. Here. Councillor Tierney. Present. Councillor Troster. Here. Vice Chair Gower. Here. And Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, and in case you're wondering, this is a public meeting to consider the comprehensive um, official plan and zoning bylaw amendments listed as 4.1 through 4.5 and 5.1 on today's agenda. For the items just mentioned, only those who make oral submissions today or written submissions before the amendments are adopted may appeal the matter to the Ontario Land Tribunal. In addition, the applicant may appeal the matter to the Ontario Land Tribunal if Council does not adopt an amendment within 90 days of receipt of the application for a zoning bylaw amendment and 120 days for an official plan amendment to submit written comments on these amendments Prior to their consideration by City Council on June 14th, 2023, please email or call the committee coordinator. Are there any declarations of interest? None. Screen. Who's joining us online today? Hi, online participants. Welcome to Planning and Housing. Um, confirmation of the minutes are the minutes of the Planning and Housing Committee meeting 9, Wednesday, May 17th, 2023. Confirmed. Uh, we have multiple items, uh, which I don't anticipate are going to take a long time to get through on the agenda today, but I would like to add one item to the agenda, which is uh, an opportunity to ask questions about the Housing Accelerator Fund um, uh, memo that was uh, uh, circulated to members, and I know there are a couple of delegations uh, looking to speak to it. Uh, do you have a motion to add that, uh, Vice Chair Gower? I do. Could you make that motion, please? All right. Uh, whereas on May 24th, 2023, Council received a memorandum from the General Manager of Planning, Real Estate, and Economic Development regarding the City of Ottawa's CMHC Housing Accelerator Fund application, and whereas it would be beneficial for the Planning and Housing Committee to formally have the opportunity to ask questions of staff prior to the submission of the City's application, therefore be it resolved that the memorandum from the general manager be added to the agenda for the June 7th Planning and Housing Committee agenda to be received as a communication and for discussion. Is that uh, carried? Thank you. Uh, going through the agenda then, there is first the zoning bylaw amendment for 1565 Maple Grove Road. Uh, we don't have any delegations on that item. The applicants uh, Tamara Nahal, Jenna McLeod and Richard Stacey and Miguel Tremblay are um, here? No, they're online. Uh, if the uh, committee is prepared to carry this, do you need to speak, uh, applicants? Uh, if it's not required, I don't need to speak, uh, Chair, and uh, happy to do so if that's helpful. Thank you. Is, uh, is that item carried? Thank you. The next item on the agenda is 1244 Kilborn Place. Uh, Thomas and Saeed are here. Saeed, good to see you. Uh, as well as Ivo Van Valentik and Richard Palmenvale from the applicants. Um, we do have uh, staff teed up with a presentation. Uh, did uh, colleagues want to receive the presentation? I think committee's prepared to carry this one. Oh, did they skip Scott? It's stuck to the it's stuck to the one. Uh, 
There we go. <laughs> I'll go back to Scott. The zoning bylaw amendment for 1546 Scott Street. Uh, staff are prepared to make a presentation if anyone would like, but there are no delegations. Uh, the applicants are with us, Tess Gilchrist, Melissa McGregor, and Michael Kogan. Are they online or are they here? They're online. Um, do the applicants want to uh, address this item, uh, even if the committee is prepared to carry it? Uh, no, unless there are any specific questions that we can answer to be helpful. Okay, there is a technical amendment as well. Uh, thanks, Vice Chair. Yeah, a technical amendment. Whereas the report seeks approval to permit a 25 story mixed use building, and whereas a technical amendment is required to correct one error in document two of the report, therefore be it resolved that with respect to the report, Planning and Housing Committee um, amend document two by substituting section 2C6, the tower portion of a building which includes any portion above the fourth floor must not have a floor plate larger than 750 meters with each floor of the tower portion of a building, which includes any portion above the fourth floor must not have a total floor area larger than 750 square meters. And be it further resolved that pursuant to subsection 3417 of the Planning Act, no further notice be given. Thank you. Did anyone want to address this item? Yes, I'm certain. I think the smoke's gotten to us. Uh, is the amendment carried? Is the item carried as amended? Thank you. Oh, crazy floor plates. I'm going to uh, go back to 1244 Kilbourne Place. Where was I in my discussion of that? Right, so we're gonna. Uh, we don't need a presentation for um, the applicants. Did you want to address this item if the committee is simply prepared to carry it? Said. Thank you. Do you have a technical one on this one going? Right. I'll check each time now. The. Yeah. I just want to say it's great to see another church developing their unused lands into housing. <laughs> we need more of this everywhere. Thank you. Fantastic, well said. Is this item carried? Carried. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna make sure the pages, the pages are sticky. I think, it's just, I think it's the smoke. For the item at 788 River Road and an unaddressed parcel, uh, there are no delegations. Staff are prepared to make a uh, presentation if uh, committee members would like one. Evan Garfunkel, Greg Winters, and James Ireland uh, are available to uh, speak to the item. Evan, Greg, and James, uh, if the committee is prepared to carry this, did you still wish to speak? Uh, no need to speak to it unless there's any questions from uh, committee. Thank you. Thank you. Is that carried? Thank you. For the item at One Old Sunset Boulevard, uh, staff are prepared to make a presentation if one is asked for. Um, we don't have any delegations. The applicants, uh, Tyler and Jamie from FOTEN and Jacques Amel are uh, available to speak to us. To the applicants, uh, if the committee is prepared to carry this one. Oh, okay. Um, did you want to ask? Okay, perfect. So. What I'll do is I'd just like to give uh, Council Menard the opportunity to ask a quick question before we uh, we go to the applicants and see mm -hmm. if they need to speak. Council Menard. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Council Leeper. I just wanted to uh, raise the issue of um, garbage storage on site. I'm supportive of the application in general. Otherwise, uh, this is one of those ones where uh, there'll be <clears throat> 11 uh, uh, people or more living in a, a single site. And there's no plan as it stands right now. It doesn't seem for uh, garbage storage. And as you know, if you don't have that, usually that's outdoors and there's not a lot of outdoor space here. So I, I guess the one thing I would ask of staff to take direction is to work with the applicant as a condition here on garbage storage in the, in the, uh, the build. <clears throat> there's 11, 11 bedrooms. Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Chair, uh, while we can't impose conditions within the context of a zoning bylaw amendment, we have been in discussions with the applicant and they have demonstrated that they are flexible and willing to work with building code service staff in order to uh, find a proper solution for waste management. 
that's fantastic to hear. Thanks so much. We'll just follow up to make sure um, that happens and appreciate the application otherwise. Thanks, Chair. Thanks to staff. Uh, do the applicants wish to make a presentation to us? Thank, thank you. Is this item, car item carried? Thank you. Is the next item uh, Hazel Dean Road? Woohoo! For the item at uh, 5618 Hazel Dean Road, uh, there is a, a presentation available if committee members want to receive that. There are no delegations. Um, the applicants uh, represented by Lisa Del Rosa and Carl Fernie are uh, prepared to make a presentation. Uh, to the applicants, do you wish to make a presentation if the committee is willing to carry this? Good morning, Lisa. Good morning, Chair. No, we're, we're, we don't need to make a presentation, but uh, as with other delegations here, we're here to answer any questions if need be. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yep, uh, Councilor Gower. Good advice, Chair. Not a question, but a quick comment. I wanted to thank uh, Minto and Foten and city staff for their collaborative work on this to uh, reach a solution. So thank you. No, and thank you for your work on that, uh, Vice Chair. Is that item carried? Thank you. So that moves us to the additional item, which is the housing affordability fund. Uh, members of council have received a memo from staff um, describing the uh, proposed approach to applying for the Federal uh, Housing Accelerator Fund. We have an opportunity this morning to ask questions of staff, but we also have a delegation um, can I just confirm? Yes. Okay. We have one delegation. Uh, Joseph, um, come on down. You've got five minutes to address the, uh, the committee. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm I'm here from uh, Make Housing Affordable, uh, which is an organization focused on the kind of the housing crisis in the city of Ottawa. As you know, we're uh, faced with a with a housing crisis with uh, a great deal of problems with supply, both of um, uh, you know for uh, uh, rental markets uh, and uh, nonprofit development, and so uh, we would like to take this opportunity to kind of address the planning committee about the opportunities presented by uh, the housing accelerator fund that the federal government is, is putting forward. Um, uh, thank you for the, for the slides. Uh, so the federal government has given us an opportunity here to uh, expand upon and add to the important reforms that city council is already taking on. Uh, and this will hopefully enable us to increase the supply of housing, particularly affordable and nonprofit housing, uh, at the same time as we get funds from the federal government for doing this. Uh, so we're getting bribed for something that we're already hoping to do. Uh, and this will enable us to hopefully do it in a way that prioritizes infill over sprawl, and which will have the happy effect of, again, increasing supply at the same time as we benefit the environment, transit, uh, people's wallets, and the city's finances. Uh, and so uh, I, I was just hoping today to go over uh, kind of 10 of the 25 reforms that the federal government is suggesting cities that uh, put forward that we hope that the city would be adopting in, in their application. And it's important to note that the slide titles here are taken directly from the CMHC's document. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so the first big one, and this was done in Toronto recently, was uh, the redevelop that was allowing um, uh, I'm sorry, this was this one was not done in Toronto yet, uh, but allowing development of up to 10 stories by right near transit, that the city is investing a lot of money into transit uh, and kind of being able to produce these walkable areas where people can have easy access to transit. Uh, it's a good thing to increase density. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, this one is what was recently done by Toronto, uh, that in, in allowing four units by right to be allowed citywide on any lot and this is something i believe the city is moving towards as well in the uh, bylaw review and hopefully uh, kind of the federal government is can push the city to to accelerate that a little on the timeline uh, next slide please 
the uh, last time I was here, it was uh, I was here in support of the Alliance to End Homelessness report, which uh, uh, Dr. Weitzman and the Alliance did excellent work on. And so we would hope that the city would would adopt all of their recommendations and the federal that would the federal government also would very much like uh, the city to to do that. Uh, and and to really support nonprofit and uh, and and kind of uh, co-op housing and and social housing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as well, a a way of encouraging affordable housing to be constructed even within for-profit units is to uh, enable density bonusing. That as uh, non as as uh, for-profit suppliers add more affordable units into a into a building, perhaps the city allows more density or more heights. Uh, and um, uh, I apologize. Uh, yes, and uh, and so that uh, that would also go away to increase both the regular uh, the for profit supply and the non profit supply. Next slide, please. Uh, as well uh, as as kind of we saw with uh, uh, three hundred and sixty Kennedy Lane recently, that parking requirements uh, do cause an obstacle to construction, uh, especially of affordable housing. And so the city implementing similar to Toronto and other cities and Edmonton, uh, the elimination of parking or the reduction of parking minimum, sim similar to what we have in the core citywide. And this is also a reform the federal government is keen on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another one, and, and this relates to the other one is enabling more housing types serving vulnerable populations. Kind of when you increase, uh, a, a, when you increase density, uh, you're able to construct more, let's say, uh, social housing or supportive housing uh, in ways that wouldn't be allowed in, in places where the density is too low to allow for that sort of thing. So enabling that would also increase increase that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as well, reducing, uh, uh, well, and streamlining urban design and character guidelines. We saw yesterday with the low rise guidelines Q &A, uh, and A, this would go a long way as, as well. Next slide. Um, Waiving public hearings on affordable housing that, again, with 360, we saw that kind of consult consultations that ultimately led nowhere, led to delays. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as well, enabling, this was also in the Alliance report, enabling mixed use redevelopment of city properties. The city owns a lot of land, a lot of properties, and kind of targeting that towards land trusts and, and, and co-ops and nonprofits and uh, would, would enable the supply of affordable housing to increase as well. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, uh, aligning development charges with infrastructure and servicing costs that we know that sprawl uh, leads to uh, greater costs for the city. And we know that increasing density can help with affordability inside of the city. So uh, aligning development charges by uh, potentially charging more outside of the Greenbelt to encourage infill development inside would lead to the sort of development that we'd be hoping for uh, in terms of uh, good dense infill instead of sprawl. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the to the councillors who took the time to email and, and meet with us before this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ostrowski. Um, I saw Royce uh, taking notes. Do city staff uh, have a copy of this presentation? Um, uh, I believe Councillor Curry forwarded the presentation to staff. Thank okay. you very much for that. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and maybe I could just ask the uh, committee coordinator just to make sure that everyone's uh, got that as well. Um, so are there any questions for uh, Joseph? See none? Oh, oh, put your hands up. Oh, I put, the, I put the timer on the screen. So I'm not. Councilor Menard. Thank you uh, very much, Chair. Thanks for being here and appreciated the report release. Uh, I think it was yesterday and uh, read through it and was happy to see a lot of the recommendations that you had put forward um, <clears throat> on development charges specifically. We're reviewing that now as a city. There's a working group that's been established to look into development charges. One thing that um, I've pointed out last term and this term is that our single unit home development charges are extremely low. Um, they are one of the lowest in the province for larger cities. And we are, uh, of course, incenting that type of growth instead of apartment buildings based on where the DCs are, in my view. So I, I'm wondering what you would feel about the, the shift in DCs um, in terms of a, a lower cost for multi-unit um, uh, homes 
uh, versus a higher cost for the single unit homes. Um, so a shift in the DCs that would kind of come out in a wash as overall uh, fees, but encourage the type of housing we say we want. Mm-hmm. Uh, so as I said, uh, that uh, that is something that uh, we would encourage, that uh, that what we would like to see is a sort of very, very dense development inside of the urban core for, for a number of reasons. And, and because uh, the goal is to increase supply and increasing the, uh, we can increase it by, you know, encouraging sprawl, or we can increase it by doing infill. And both of those are viable paths for the city to take. Uh, so when the city is looking towards ways of increasing construction, we would greatly prefer for it to be inside of the city core uh, rather than through sprawl. No, I appreciate it. Appreciate that and your comments around uh, sprawl and the, the cost to the city uh, that comes with that. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for being here. I also got a chance to quickly um, breeze through the um, platform that you've put together. I look forward to discussing it further. I just had a question because you talk about either eliminating or reducing development charges to incent purpose-built rentals. Um, but how do you have any suggestions or have you put into thought um, into how you think the city might encourage uh, a more of a diversity of um, apartment sizes, specifically larger homes? Because I'll tell you, every private developer I've spoken to seems to think that you can't build a three-bedroom apartment for less than a million dollars, which I know is categorically untrue. Um, but it, you know, right now, the only thing we have to compel larger apartments is in the official plan um, when there's a certain amount of height. So we're sometimes getting one or two <laughs> out of a building. But I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts around that. Uh, well, I think the... The province, for example, has um, development charge uh, discounts for the number of units that are put in, uh, sorry, for the number of bedrooms that are put into a rental unit. Uh, so sort of uh, potentially building on that, the city could uh, encourage m- more bedrooms in, in rental units uh, and maybe working with the federal government to, to kind of uh, revitalize programs that used to exist for incentivizing rental housing in the city. Yeah, the only red flag that I saw in your proposal, and I look forward to talking it through more with you, is every developer who's coming to me in my ward right now is for purpose-built rentals because the condo market is kind of tanked, um, but none of these are affordable. And in a lot of cases, they're leading to displacement, specifically in center town, the removal of larger, more affordable homes um, for taller, denser buildings, which I support but filled with really, really tiny apartments, like 400, two, you know, 300, 400, 600 square feet. And so I would be very cautious about providing any sort of financial incentive for more of that type of housing when I would like to see the density, but I want those homes to be more livable. So, and I would rather see those incentives go to nonprofit housing providers for purpose-built affordable rentals, but we can talk about that more later. Thank you so much. Uh, could, I, could I reply to that? Yeah, go for Thank it. you. Uh, I would just say that one of the things um, is by incentivizing kind of the missing middle housing that we would want to see across the entire city, uh, we can take off a lot of the pressure on the core uh, where we're seeing we're seeing these displacements happen. But by enabling kind of uh, four to eight stories scattered around the city more, we're able to, to kind of produce less of these enormous towers uh, and, and single family homes that are kind of the dichotomy here. And so by, by spreading, that's one of the things that I would say that, that would possibly uh, deal with that concern. And of course, we very much would like more nonprofit and uh, co-op housing, things like that. Thank you. I agree. You. We need density everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I do have a, a, a quick question. So development charges um, as ordinarily applied, so notwithstanding discounts that may be coming into place with Bill 23, are very closely tied to things like level of service, right? The the cost of building infrastructure is what drives the cost or the, the development charge. Just taking a really quick look at the difference between um, inside and outside the green belt for singles and semi-detached, the difference inside and outside the green belt uh, on the total engineering charges, so roads, sewers, uh, water, stuff like that, it is uh, 26914 for a door in uh, outside 
the green belt. It's 20,607 inside the green belt. So outside the green belt, the cost um, that is being charged or the development charge is 30% more. Is that, is that too, is that not a big enough difference in your view? Um, Cause it, it seems like a very significant difference in development charges where it's costing more for the engineering DC outside the green belt. Um, I'm, I'm not 100% uh, certain, but I, I, one of the things that I would say is a, a lot of the stuff we're seeing inside the green belt is a lot of multi-unit, like a lot of, a lot of units being constructed. So it's kind of the cost for one single family home outside of the green belt uh, versus the, the development charge is kind of piling up over an entire apartment building that might have, let's say a hundred units in it. Um, so that, that's just a, I, I guess a thought I would have about that. Um, but I, I can't speak to, Okay, I'm not a hundred percent certain, I'm sorry. It, it would be interesting to get that from um, Make Housing Affordable is, is some of those proposed DCs and then you know tying that to the level of service, tying that to the 10 year uh, historical cost. Um, and if we need to go to the province to uh, find different methodologies for calculating DCs, uh, you know, maybe that's something that uh, Make Housing Affordable could help us with. Just I, I really quickly took a look um, inside and outside the green belt on uh, multi res. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think we're looking at you know, roughly that 30 yeah. percent discount. Uh, well, maybe not as much um, outside the green belt uh, multi res or is 14432 inside the green belt 11379 a door. So. You know, we're applying that methodology as is allowed to be used by the province is being applied to account for uh, the different cost of building servicing inside and outside the green belt. Uh, but something that um, uh, your group might want to delve a little bit more into. Any other questions? Councillor Kavanaugh? Kelly's like saving my bacon this morning. I was just going to pass right on again. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Sorry, I just didn't want to bike in this weather. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, 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 Andrew, uh, for the, uh, what you're working on. Um, I just want to know, um, in, as chair of Ottawa Community Housing, how this is going to help Ottawa Community Housing um, as, the, as the city is the single shareholder of, of this corporation. Um, and um, just want to know what we can see um, in terms of... Uh, the future for on this program. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think several ways. The, the first one is um, the, the sort of housing that Ottawa Community Housing constructs tends to be uh, denser and require less parking than other uh, for-profit developments that happen in the city. So kind of um, making it easier to construct that sort of dense housing already uh, would enable OCH to have an easier way through um, say community consultations uh, or things like that and, and have a wider area across the city to build housing in. Uh, at the same time, uh, th things like that, that were brought up in the Alliance report about utilizing city land uh, and uh, working with nonprofit providers to, to put up more housing would also go a long way to, to, doing, uh, to facilitating the work that OCH does, I think. Thank you. Um, and um, as uh, Councillor Troster mentioned about bigger units, um, Ottawa Community Housing is is willing to to um, have those bigger units, um, which is very helpful. We know that there's large families in need, and um, though th those there's still a need out there. So, I think that's something that um, also helps out, as well as the other nonprofits. By the way, I'm not um, being exclusive, but um, but it strikes me that uh, with the lower cost per per unit that uh, that they're charging, um, it's, it's they're good investments uh, for the city. Thank you for all the work on this. Thank you, Councillor Kavanaugh, Councillor Kelly. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Joseph. And you just mentioned the uh, the Alliance report and the the idea of the use of public lands for affordable housing and. Uh, particularly not-for-profit housing providers. I, I love the idea of not just the use of the land, but perhaps giving the land or selling the land for a very low cost to not-for-profit housing providers so that they have an asset to use as leverage um, that they could you know, use to um, fund their capital 
uh, projects. So I'm wondering, and I'm, I'm guessing, or you know, I'm not an expert, but I'd like to hear your perspective on what your thoughts are on the effectiveness of that approach versus a million dollars extra here or a million dollars extra there to build four units rather than arming these organizations with the tools they need to uh, to compete um, in that market with for-profit housing providers. That's all. Uh, I, I would say that uh, both are needed, uh, that obviously the land and, and uh, giving the land for, for free or for very low cost or, or leasing it to nonprofit providers would, would do a, a great deal to uh, enable them to increase the supply. Uh, but at the same time, for uh, the, the city to make headway on on its own plans for um, for for unit construction, uh, there does need to be, you know, due to inflation and the high costs of construction that we've seen, uh, kind of a, at least a doubling of the um, current capital budget for affordable housing. Uh, that it was a sixteen million this year, um, but just for it to keep up with where. The plan currently is. Uh, that's why the increase is is, is needed there. Uh, so I would say that both are both would be needed in order to fulfill the city's uh, plans and to 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 get that sort of housing constructed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Kelly. Are there any further questions for the delegation? See none. Joseph, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Today. Um, so we have the opportunity, I don't think uh, we're not asking staff to make a presentation, but I know councillors did have some questions for staff, so um, I think Royce is coming up. Thank you. And I believe uh, Councillor Trost will be first. Thank you very much for being here, and thank you for all the work that went into the housing accelerator fund application. I know that these are tremendously huge things to work on. Um, and I know we had some private discussions and a conversation, but I just wanted to get them on the record and, and allow the rest of the committee to hear some of the conversation. Um, so following the discussion that we had, it was made clear that staff would be clarifying uh, the language in the application to stress the preferred nature of nonprofit partnerships in terms of any use of city lands for housing. I'm wondering if you could clarify uh, what changes are being proposed to clarify this intent. So Chair, before we begin, I just want to introduce the team um, in front of committee. So we have uh, Paul Levine, the Director of uh, Housing Services, and um, uh, Lauren Reeves, uh, Manager of Affordable Housing, and Megan Brody is the lead on uh, our half file. And we also have Peter Radke, Director of uh, Real Estate online as well. So. Um, I think you can ask Peter to, to interject, um, might give, give him a minute to turn his um, microphone and, and camera on. Um, but with that, perhaps we can, um, Paul or Lauren, if you want to start with that, and maybe Peter can jump in on the city-owned lands. Chair, um, so I think you're asking about uh, clarifying the priority for not-for-profit housing. Uh, and so um, in that respect, we're looking at particularly two of the initiatives, one being the pipeline strategy. And that is where we are uh, targeting probably most of the funding that we would receive. We would like to direct that to the not-for-profit uh, housing providers that have shovel ready projects. Uh, and as you're aware, the city has been um, funding uh, pre-development uh, work to a number of our housing providers over the last several years uh, and OCH as well. Uh, there are many uh, units that are shovel ready and they're just waiting for capital funding to, uh, to start construction. So we think that is uh, probably the number one priority for the uh, housing accelerator funding. And they have their own land. Uh, so the second initiative that I think you were referring to is the uh, vacant land strategy. And with that, now we're looking at a window where permits must be issued by September of 2026. And when we're starting with vacant raw land, uh, it's, it's a fairly uh, slow process. And so there are only a few properties that we were able to identify 
uh, that are city owned that could achieve permit issuance uh, by that date. Um, and so uh, I think the majority of the units we expect would be uh, not for profit. Again, we want to issue um, uh, requests for proposals for uh, city land uh, with a, and partner with a not-for-profit housing provider. But there's a, another component to, uh, to the land strategy and that's what um, OCLDC and uh, the corporate real estate office works in. There's just a small component of uh, um, an opportunity there to achieve permits by 2026, but perhaps Peter would like to speak to that. Can I just clarify, my, my question is more around the criteria for disposal of public land. I'm very concerned about disposal of public land. Um, so could you explain to me under what circumstances in this application that you refer to that public land would be sold or given to a private developer versus a nonprofit housing? Uh, I can respond to that, uh, Peter Ratchby. So uh, the application doesn't change anything that's in our disposal policy. So our disposal policy remains the same. So when we look to dispose of land, we're going to circulate that land internally uh, uh, through the city departments to make sure there isn't a city need for the lands. At that time, uh, housing services is included in that uh, circulation. If they put up their hand to, to say this is a, a good piece of property for an affordable housing provider, then our process stops and the lands essentially be, get reserved to, to go through uh, Lauren's process. If, uh, if nobody puts up their hand for the lands, then we do bring a report forward to finance, or, yeah, finance and corporate services committee and uh, with a report to, to ask me to declare it surplus if the lands are strategic in nature, staff would be recommending it go to the Land Development Corporation for disposal. If it's just a general disposal, then the, the corporate real estate uh, staff would dispose of it. So, so nothing is changing from the current process. Thank you. Okay, so I'm wondering if you could clarify to me, so you mentioned one of the criteria for disposing public land to private developer, as I read in the application, was some sort of, arrangement that 25% of that land would be used for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you could uh, expand on the definition of affordability um, in those circumstances that you would be employing. Uh, Chair, uh, I think you're speaking to the land and funding policy, the affordable, um, affordable housing land and funding policy. And in that policy, uh, when land is disposed of, housing services can request of uh, OCLDC uh, to include 25% of the units as affordable housing, where it's being disposed of for residential purposes. Or we could request that we receive 25% of the net revenues of the sale, which would be directed into the housing reserve fund. Um, so it's an either or scenario. In terms of affordability, um, it's in terms of Action Ottawa is our definition at the moment, and we target 80% of average market rent up to average market rent, which is still less than what you would uh, uh, obtain through private market. Okay, so I know we're referring to the CMHC definition of affordability, which is 80% of median market rent. I just want to state that is not deep affordability by any stretch of the imagination. Right now, a one bedroom apartment is going for $2,100 in downtown Ottawa. So 80% of that is still completely unattainable for um, the folks in my neighborhood who are living on fixed incomes. Um, what is preventing us from uh, demanding a deeper definition of affordability in those instances? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as reported, earlier in different conversation to different committees, we will be uh, refreshing our 10 year housing and homelessness plan. And one of our priorities we, will be to uh, review the definition of, of affordability. There are several definitions out there. And uh, there's the, obviously there's not 100% uh, agreement of what uh, affordability means. And in the context of our, of our reality, of course, uh, the different population and different families and their realities that they face every day. 
Um, so we will be uh, taking a look at, at our policy, revising our policy, engaging with, with our community partners, uh, doing lots of consultation, and bringing back a report to council, a uh, committee and council for their consideration moving forward. I'll just say I was at a workshop with CMHC last weekend at the FCM conference yes. where I straight up told them that their definition is unacceptable and that we have a lot of private developers that are taking advantage of the sweet CMHC financing and, and not delivering affordable housing. The program's just not working. So um, I would inc I, I look forward to further conversations because I understand as each piece of land is considered being disposed, that's something that comes to us and comes to council. And I would really encourage us to have stronger guardrails around, um, you know, ensuring that we're not, the land is so valuable and it's one of the biggest assets the city has. And to quote Dr. Carolyn Weitzman, the first rule of land club is don't sell the land. <laughs> um, so I'm, ju I'm just really worried about the potential to sell off valuable city land and to not produce affordable housing out of it, to produce housing, but not the kind of housing that's gonna help the folks who are on the wait list uh, of 12,000 people or in my neighborhood are really struggling. So. Thank you very much. Thanks for all of the work on this. Um, I look forward to further conversations about, you know, hopefully once we receive HAF funding, we can have a broader conversation about how to, how to stack some of our programs to make sure that we're employing the strongest definition of affordability possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Troster. I just want to make sure, are you satisfied that you, you've gotten an answer to, I think, the question? I want to make sure that I'm um, understanding the question, I think what you're asserting is that there should be strong policies in place at the city to ensure that when land that is suitable for residential development are uh, disposed of, that that go into the hands of not-for-profit uh, partners to the city, uh, including potentially OCH, uh, so that we have you know, fairly guaranteed deep affordability. And I, I just want to make sure that you've heard what you need to hear today. I think so. Is there a right of first refusal? Is this what you're saying with disposal of public lands? Is there a right of first refusal to nonprofit developers? So, Chair, if I can, uh, the half application is not finalizing any of the programs before. We're just framing all the initiatives that we think we can bring forward that will increase housing, whether it's going to be new permits or affordable housing. Each of these initiatives will have their own stream to further answer those, those questions. So, in terms of answering that question, I think what Mr. Levine was saying is that there's an opportunity for council to further refine the criteria for that at a future date. It's just not a part of this application. So you're saying it's on us <laughs> to set that criteria. You will have that ability for each of these Great. programs to do that. Yeah. Thank you. That really does help. Thank you. And that's clear for me as well. Um, it is, uh, you know, at some point, council will have to make that policy because that policy doesn't exist today. Um, thank you. Um, Councillor Gower, Vice Chair Gower, sorry. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just wanted to, we we did, the councillors received just before today's meeting, um, some feedback from the Alliance and Homelessness. Um, so heads up for committee members. One of their requests to council or recommendations to staff, I suppose, is ask for more money. And uh, they point out there's no dollar value in the memo. So I'm curious, uh, if, as part of the application, are we going to be asking for a specific dollar amount? I'm just not sure what the mechanics are of, of how we apply and what's included there. Yes, through you, Mr. Chair, we, we absolutely will be requesting a specific dollar amount. The fund itself is $4 billion, and that's split across every municipality in Canada that has the opportunity to apply. So it is a, a finite amount. And ultimately, we won't know how much we receive until after our application is evaluated. So we can apply for as much as we'd like, and we're trying our best to optimize our eligibility. But CMHC um, does have the discretion to cut that back in accordance with, you know, the finite dollar amount that they have and the number of applications they receive and the strength of those applications. So we will be um, including a, an actual dollar figure. Um, right now, we're looking at applying for at least 150 to $200 million, um, hoping to shoot for more, but um, ultimately CMHC will has the discretion to cut us back. And do they prescribe a formula for how municipalities come up with that amount that we're asking for? Absolutely, they okay. do. And um, that formula uh, really shaped our application. It's how we selected initiatives. 
and uh, framed our assumptions. It's how we selected the definition of affordability that we did for the purpose of the application, um, because it all worked together to optimize the amount of funding that we would be able to request. Okay, well, I'll echo the advice of the Alliance, which is I'd encourage staff to be as bold and as, as ambitious as possible, both to reflect the absolute pressing need that we have in the city, but also that we are a city that's committed and, and ambitious and um, wants to uh, wants to achieve our goals and really make a difference on this. So um, the other question I had was, I know we've had this as counselors for about a week and a half. Um, can you give us a sense of what kind of feedback you've had from counselors so far? Any themes that are coming through on so far? Yeah, Cheryl, I'll take a stab at that. And um team members can, can fill in. Uh, one of the main buckets was, of course, affordability. And the definition of affordability is that we just talked about. Um, within the application, the affordability definition we used was very broad. Um, the purpose of that was to maximize the funding that we get. And so through the future programs, council can take that the funding that we get that we maximize and then allocate to more finer tuned tiers of affordable, affordable housing. So that was the reason why we had that our average market rent set as the affordable target. Um, there was feedback on the use of city owned lands and what are the policies for that. And again, as we just discussed, that is something that we would bring back to council to fine tune as part of our program. But we identified that um, as an initiative that could bring on new building permits. Um, I guess the, the last category is really the preparation of the application. Um, so it was very much comments on being ambitious to try to maximize the funding opportunities. Um, what are the precise measurements? So uh, CMHC and, and a lot of the comments, the delegations and the, the information we've received from the nonprofit sector, we agree with all of those ideas. Uh, just for the purpose of this application though, it is very specific to net new building permits by September 1, 2026. And if it cannot be measured in terms of that, then we will not get funding. So everything we have to do within three-year window through application is tied to that. So a lot of the ideas that we've received, they're great ideas, but just in terms of how to move forward in the process of those, those would probably be permits after 2026, which is why we did not include in the application. It doesn't mean we're not working on them. Um, and so that is, we so we received a lot of good ideas on um, including other initiatives within the application. Um, the problem is the framework of how CMHC measures um, the funding received. We would not be able to include those ideas because it does not a direct correlation to net new permits. So those are the general themes that I recall from the feedback we've received from council. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if this is helpful, but I, I wanted to share like a counselor trust or some of the conversations I've had with staff behind the scenes as well. So that this is so everyone's clear on what's going on. Um, I sat on a federal grants committee before and handed out millions of dollars. And I sat on the Ottawa Community Foundation grants committee for seven years. And so my, some of my comments to staff have been about the application, right? So there's $4 billion to get. Uh, the people that have the best applications will get the money. And that's, it's as simple as that. And, and speaking to some of the MPs locally, their comment to me always is your application better be good. And that's as much as, as a piece of good advice as they give us, because the application is the key. So at the Ottawa Community Foundation, we have very clear uh, requests for what your application needs to have in it. And we've heard that today, right? It, it has to be net new, has to be permits by 2026, right? So putting something in there that doesn't have that means they, your application looks terrible. Um, there are applications that we saw at the federal provincial grant uh, committee that I was on that immediately did not meet the criteria. So immediately just go into the $0 category. Well, that's what actually happens in these meetings. You have conversations where you uh, can tell that the application met uh, the criteria because the applicant worked with the grantor, right? So we are working with CMHC. That's the smartest move in town. The people that get money at the Ottawa Community Foundation work with the staff at the Ottawa Community Foundation throughout their whole application. So the fact that we're doing that already will set us apart if other municipalities aren't doing that. Um, the other thing I will say is that the things that we always look for in grants is that there are clear financials. So for example, 
uh, a municipality that put in an application that uh, said, oh, well, this this is going to cost us about $20,000. They would not get funding. The, the application that came in that was very specific that said this application, this project will cost us $18,946.22 was a, an application we looked more carefully at because it was clear that the financials were thought through. There wasn't just a round number that was thrown out. The financials are gone through by a financial expert and already marked as legit or not legit. So that is a big marker that it has to actually follow what your financials you submit have in them actually match exactly what you're going to say. All of that is checked. Um, the other thing that is 100% um, important is that all of the projects are as shovel ready as they can be. Shovel ready is the number one project. So you know, I, I hear absolutely what we would like to see and what we would like to have happen, but the shovel ready projects get the money for two reasons. Number one, because the federal government in this case would want to be able to cut a ribbon soon and say, look at what we did, right? So that's that's not necessarily their number one, but that I'm listing that as there's number one, it has to be shovel ready. Uh, they also want to see a pipeline so that you know you can't take on all projects, right, as soon as the application, as soon as the money is given, right, so that there would be a regular pipeline that would be achievable. So that has to be clear in the application. And the government understands the time value of money, right? So if they're going to give this money now and none of your projects are going to come to fruition until 2026, they know you're probably not even going to achieve what you wanted to achieve. So you have to demonstrate that you understand the time value of money for this money that you get. All that matters is what's in your application. So people in, in the room, like I experienced, you sit around and you go through all these things. Did this application meet this criteria, this criteria, this criteria? Is this money actually going to be used properly and usefully? And all of that has to be in the application. And that's the end goal, that we get the money opposed to uh, some other municipality. So I was just going to share some of that. Those are the kinds of comments that I've been making with staff. Um, the other is the bang for the buck, right? So we always look at how many people will this impact, right? So maybe a great project, if there's five units, well, maybe another municipality has something the same thing, but it's 200 units. So these are the types of things that are looked at. You know, I understand to many of the comments here, what we would like to see and what we want to promote and what's important to us. But in order to get the money, you have to do that. They set out a number of um, webinars that applicants are to watch. They don't do that for no reason. If you watch the webinars, it's like a roadmap to success. And so my understanding from staff is they watched all the webinars very carefully. They're working with CMHC. They understand all the rules. That's what I'm hearing today. So I have lots of confidence uh, that our application will be good. Um, I tell you at the end of the day, you made the comment at the beginning, it's Canada wide. Uh, what we had to do for our Ontario portion was make sure that it was spread across Ontario um, adequately because remember there are MPs that wanna be doing that ribbon cutting. So an MP in uh, Northern Ontario, Northern Quebec also wants some money for the municipality. They take that into consideration, sadly, not only the application. So you're up against a lot of things when you, um, when you submit your application. But from what I'm hearing, if, if we have all of those things in our application, and it sounds like we do, I think we will, we're on the right track. So anyway, thank you. I just wanted to make those comments. So that, those are the comments I've been making behind the scenes. Thank you very much, Councillor Curry. Councillor Lowe. Thank you. I kind of want to build on uh, some of the comments that Councillor Troster made a little earlier about uh, the definition of affordability. And I believe you had mentioned there's a report coming that kind of refreshes that a little bit. Um, I think it's fair to assume that it's going to Community Services Committee. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. And then uh, what is the timeline for that, roughly? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to clarify, the committee will be planning and housing committee for the definition of affordability. Thank you. And uh, do you have a rough timeline for when that may come? Uh, Mr. Chair, maybe late fall, we anticipate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lowe. Councillor Kavanaugh? Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess I guess the the affordability is, is the big question, and um, we know what deep affordability is. Um, and frankly, I think that um, governments are responding to that. Um, we just saw that with the case of us not getting funding, and then 
Ottawa Community Housing having a project that is actually in pro progress, um, getting um, getting the attention of the Ontario government, um, with which was Mikinac. And um, that was something that was uh, showed exactly what they should be doing. So it's they can take some credit for it. Um, so I, I can see the points of um, Councillor Curry because that's exactly what's needed. And OCH gets that very much um, and um, is ready to be um, right there. Um, and it's for deep affordable, though we are doing mixed. So um, I hope to see that continue. I appreciate in the report, you talk about uh, some areas of the transit oriented development, um, particularly around uh, Queensview, Pinecrest, which, is, um, which are new areas that um, have not been developed before. Um, and we have city owned land there, um, which we are now um, currently leasing to um, police services. So I, I think we still need to have conversations about using our own land for affordable housing um, and, and look at these options as well. Um, so um, can I have some comments on, on the, the land we use that we have currently near um, the new transit stations? Uh, I, I can speak to the, you know, the Queensview land. So uh, you're correct, the police do have uh, uh, control of that land right now and we will be in discussions with them about the future of that, if not, a a lease per se. We don't lease land to other, you know, sort of city groups, but uh, we do have an arrangement with them where they they utilize that that building. So that's something we'll be discussing with them in the coming weeks. Thank you. I appreciate that, and uh, I think it's an opportunity, and um, we it, it can only it, it can only be improved. Um, um, but it, it's um, the other thing that concerns me is. Um, the fact that we're always talking about the number of units, but not the type of units. And this goes back to the size of the units and the fact that um, we can, you know, say, you know, we, you know, we build a hundred units, but if they're all very small, um, we haven't accomplished the needs of families, which I, I'm always concerned about. So how can we differentiate that so that we can show that we're helping larger numbers of people actually, um, and it is families that tend to be um, in the most need these days. So Chair, on, on that uh, specific differentiation of dwellings, uh, CMHC application does differentiate between uh, dwelling types, but it's not by dwelling sizes. So it speaks to units that are missing middle, middle type of housing, uh, multi-unit outside of transit and multi-unit uh, within transit. So staff have been working on providing estimates within, within those categories because those cat are the categories that ultimately have funding tied to them. Thank you. Um, anyway, I hope we have some targets of our, of our own um, that, um, that show that we're, um, you know, whether the, they're, it's in their definition of, of X number of units that are family units versus um, the smaller units, which are needed too. We, we need seniors units uh, and uh, seniors buildings actually. And, and I hope that's taken into consideration because I'm hearing a lot um, from the, uh, the communities where uh, seniors live and there's, there's gonna be a lot of need very soon um, as, as that population grows. Um, is there anything specific on, on that category? So Chair, we, we, we would be looking at those aspects of housing as part of a secondary plan process, for example, at Pinecrest Queensview, but that would be separate from the half application. Okay, well, I look forward to further conversations um, about those specific areas and, uh, and hopefully we can, um, we can work together on that. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I was just curious, what is preventing us from asking for more money? Is it because we don't have enough shovel ready projects that would qualify by 2026? Thank you, Chair. So nothing is, is truly preventing us from, from asking for more money. We are um, trying to be as realistic as possible in our projections, obviously. Um, we do need to report back to CMHC annually 
including uh, building permit numbers. So we'll need to be able to say, these are the following building permits we issued in the past year and which initiative they fall under. So we will have a requirement to show that we're making progress towards our original projections. And if we uh, don't uh, make that progress, if we're really far away from uh, reaching those projections, then our funding is compromised. Um, it hasn't come up yet, but um, we do receive our funding in 25% installments annually. And that last installment is compromised if um, our report that immediately precedes it shows that we're not uh, hitting those targets. So uh, the projections that we um, are working on right now, um, I believe, um, you know, optimize the amount of funding that we can while still being within the realm of um, reasonableness. Um, and, and we really do believe that we can achieve those projections and going too far could be a red flag for CMHC as well. And they can always scale us back. I guess my question for you is if there's anything we can do as a committee or council um, to help enable us to be more ambitious. Is there something at a policy level that we are not doing that makes it difficult to scale up? Or is this a concern about supply chains of the actual builders? Yeah, Chair, I mean, that last point from the council is a really good point. There's a lot of things outside of the role of municipalities to, to move those permits forward. So we'd all have to be working together and all things being equal, we could try to influence that, but there are some bigger things out there, such as interest rates and labor market. And we all know that from the housing pledge that also come into play that we have to think about as well. One last question. My understanding is the CMHC asked you to use the housing assessment resource tool to help identify uh, potential land uh, to develop as nonprofit housing. I'm just wondering if you use that tool. It's a super technical question. Use it for the refresh room. Chair, the um, the heart tool is expected to be employed through our um, housing. What's it called? Needs assessment. Housing needs assessment uh, report, which will precede uh, the ten year housing and homelessness plan uh, review refresh. Um, the housing needs assessment report is also a requirement of the half application. And it is required by within two years. Within two years. Within two years. <laughs> so the tool will be used uh, in order to complete that piece of the application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Kavanaugh. Yeah, just one last question. If in our our review of processes, is there any way that we can uh, fast track affordable housing, deep affordable housing? and put it at the top of the list. So Chair, I just would echo my earlier comments that um, that's something that council would look at when staff brings forward those, um, those initiatives such as the affordable housing pipeline strategy and the city owned land strategy to, to look at what are the mechanisms that we can do to fast track those applications. Um, but wouldn't be something we identify as part of the half application. Okay, so we'll definitely have to look at that. Thank you. All right, thank you very much uh, to colleagues for some uh, pointed questions on the, the memo that received. Staff, thank you very much. I know we keep hauling you in front of the committee to talk about uh, some of these issues, but it is, um, uh, I think, indicative of the, the clear priority that this committee is placing in this term of council on getting a lot of new, particularly deeply affordable housing built. So uh, thank you for coming and answering our questions. Uh, I believe, I don't believe there's any action to take out of that. We've uh, simply received that for information. So I'm going to move on through the uh, last bit of the agenda. Uh, there was uh, an information piece uh, that was previously distributed uh, with respect to the reserve appointment to the Committee of Adjustment. I think that was panel one. We needed to go to a, a reserve member. Um, notices a motion. Councillor Hill uh, has a notice of motion, which because he's not part of this awesome committee, um, we've had to ask uh, Councillor Gower to uh, move on his behalf, please. Yep. So no, on behalf of Councillor Hill, whereas the new official plan designates the, designates the land 3809 Boris O'Kane Road as industrial and logistics, and whereas these lands have direct access to municipal services, 
And whereas Barhaven and rural South Ottawa would significantly benefit from additional economic activity should the exclusion lands begin development, and whereas it is important to create economic development opportunities, especially ones that are within walking and biking distance of residents, whereas the new official plan includes item 5.6.2.110, prescribes these lands be included in the CDP for the residential expansion lands to the south, and that the development of these lands cannot proceed until the CDP and associated studies have been approved. And where staff have identified that future development of these lands may be influenced by the need for water main looping or enhanced infiltration of stormwater, therefore be it resolved that council staff uh, be directed, I think that's council, no, staff be directed to initiate an official plan amendment to amend 5.6.2.110 to enable development to proceed on 3809 Boris O'Kane Road in advance of the CDP for the residential expansion lands to the south and to ensure that adequate measures are taken to protect for water main looping and enhanced stormwater infiltration. Water main looping sounds fun. I want to go water main looping today. Uh, thank you very much. We'll deal with that at our uh, next uh, planning committee meeting. Thank you, Councillor Hill. Uh, inquiries, I know Councillor Kitts has one. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, this is seeking information regarding the number of approved applications that did not include a tra uh, traffic impact assessments in my ward. So the questions are as follows. How many planning applications were approved within Ward 19, Orleans South Navin, between October 2018 and May 2023? And that's the newly configured version that includes... Uh, land that used to reside in Ward 2 Innis. How many applications were approved without a comprehensive traffic impact assessment due to the application not meeting the traffic impact assessment threshold trigger? Three, what is the total number of parking spots approved within the list of developments mentioned above? What would be the approximate cumulative peak hour AM morning trips that have resulted from the approved developments? And what would be the approximate cumulative peak hour PM afternoon evening trips that have resulted from the approved developments. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll look forward to seeing a response to that on a future agenda. Uh, are there any other inquiries? Seeing none, we have no other business and we will adjourn what has to be the worst chaired meeting of this term of council. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank Breathe easy. Thank you.